Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. My name is Susan Kornfeld, and this is our November 1st plant clinic. And while it's nice to um, gather under the beautiful Rose Arbor at the San Mateo Arboretum, it's also nice to gather here together in the comfort of our own home. So today we have a wonderful group of Master Gardener panelists. And um, this is our group and we'll be answering your garden questions today and perhaps even indulging in some garden chat. I'd like to have each of them introduce themselves to you. So we will start with Cindy Bergdorf. Good morning, Cindy. Morning. Um, my name is Cindy uh, and there, we have a few other Cindy's here. Um, I live in Atherton. I've been a um, master gardener since 2008. I enjoy gardening. I've been doing it since I was eight years old and uh, grew uh, cherry tomatoes in my grandmother's garden. I have uh, four beehives in my yard and I like working with wildlife habitats and pollinators. Next we have Cindy Morris. I've been a master gardener since 2010, and um, I enjoy herbs, um, houseplants, orchids. I love growing from seed, and I live in San Carlos. And next is Cynthia Nations. Greetings. My name is Cynthia Nations. Uh, I'm from Texas, but I moved to the El Granada area uh, close to Half Moon Bay. Uh, in 2012. I graduated in the class of 2015 and I'm really interested in uh, organic vegetable gardening and I'm always um, reorganizing and redoing a lot of things in my yard. I, I enjoy it so much. Okay, Jonathan. What happened to Jonathan? He needs to turn up his volume, I think. No, I need to unmute. Oh, <laughs> um, Hi, Jonathan. I, I'm from class of 2008. I live in Menlo Park and uh, I love to grow my own organic uh, fruits and vegetables. Great. All right, and um, Betsy. Hi, I'm Betsy Shelton and I uh, have been a master gardener since 2008. I live in Half Moon Bay and some of my favorite plants are camellias and wisterias. Thank you, Betsy. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm Susan Kornfeld. I live in Half Moon Bay and I've been a master gardener since 2016. Um, I started as plant clinic lead at the San Mateo Arboretum. I really enjoy talking plants with people who come by. Um, and my favorite thing in gardening is believe it or not weeding. And I also enjoy uh, pruning our big beautiful shrubs that grow so well out here on the coast. So, um, we have received several questions in advance from people who submitted them. And we hope to also get questions from some of you who might be here who didn't send them in, in advance. So let's just jump right into it. But before we do, I'd like to introduce another master gardener, Maggie Ma, and she will be monitoring our chat, our chat box. Um, when you have a question, just type it in and she will keep an eye on that. So Maggie, I'd like you to introduce yourself too. Hi, I'm Maggie Ma. I live in Woodside and um, I'm a first year master gardener. So I, one of the reasons I love doing the, um, the plant clinic virtually is that I learned so much from all these very seasoned and experienced gardeners. It's a real joy to do that. Um, I'm, I had 30 tomato plants in my garden, all different kinds this year. And um, I'm trying to convert uh, areas of my yard that um, into native plantings. So that's keeping me busy. Great, great. So go ahead and put your questions in as we go, but we will pause after the um, advanced questions and you'll have another chance to put your questions in. So let's just dive yeah. in with question one from Janet. So she has a plant with white flowers that purchased many years ago but the understanding was an herb and, what was, and it was edible, but she's forgotten what it was. 
So this is a very, very important question. And she did send pictures. Um, Betsy, um, can I take this first and then I'll turn it over to you? Because Absolutely. I did extensive research and I, I was, you know, trying to find an, an herb with these blueberries. And I first, at first, went to um, bilberry, which is, um, actually, I found out bilberries are uh, actually a stronger blueberry and they grow them extensively in Europe. And it, they also, it also has, it's an herb that's used also for, it has very uh, strong antioxidant properties. And I would just really research, as a matter of fact, I think I might uh, try to find a bilberry to grow in my yard. But then uh, when uh, Janet uh, sent in closer pictures, I, I was really, um, I couldn't um, come to grips with the, the, the way the leaves are shaped. So then Betsy had a great suggestion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Betsy. Okay, so my guess based on what I can see in the pictures is that this is a dwarf myrtle. Um, one of the earlier pictures that's not so close up made, makes the plant look fairly small. A regular myrtle gets pretty tall. It'll get eight or 10 feet tall, but dwarf myrtle stays more like three feet. And um, uh, myrtle is, I think, more familiar to people in Europe. For some reason, I've had a couple conversations with people from Europe who asked me questions about myrtle. And I, um, and I don't, people don't seem to raise the question much here in California, but um, it, it matches the appearance of the flowers and the appearance of the leaves and, and it does make blue colored berries that look, I believe match this. Um, and uh, so, and it does sometimes get used and I've given Maggie a link. She has a link that she can share that has a little short paragraph about the way sometimes people used Myrtle um, in in cooking or in barbecuing, um, but before you use it for actually cooking or barbecuing, I, I'd want you to really be certain that it's Myrtle that I haven't guessed wrong. Um, and one one way to be certain is to take a piece, maybe six or eight inches long of a branch, into your local. Um, good nursery, a, you know, a local family run nursery. And most of the people who work there will be able to give you a, a, an identification. Um, I don't know if the person who asked this question is with us. Another couple things you can do to just verify are to make, take a careful look at the way the leaves attach to the stem, to the twigs and Myrtle, they, they're opposite. The leaves will be exactly opposite each other um, and also the edges of the leaves are very smooth. On myrtle, the edges don't have little, little serrations. So those are a couple other things you can do to just confirm. Great, well, Betsy, it sounds like more than just your guess. It sounds very well researched. Um, if we could go back one slide to the um, other two. Uh, so when we first, we first look at, at a plant like this, like Betsy said, she looked at the size of it. And that's indicative. And you look at the way that the, the, the branches and twigs are growing out and you look at the multi trunk and then you start looking at the berries and leaves and that's kind of a, a good process for identification. Okay, so um, I think we're up to the second question, which I, I saw briefly. Okay, this question too from Yvonne and she has a a warm and fuzzy question. How can I prevent mice from coming and nesting in my compost? She found a litter of baby mice. She turns the compost every week and she has one of those three layer stackable ones. So how could that happen? And how can she prevent that in the future? Any panelists have any ideas on that? She needs to make sure that the lid on top of the stacks is secure. Uh, mice can get into something as small as a 25 cent piece. So you need to make sure that the top is on securely. I, I have six compost bins um, of the three layer stackable kind. I've had them here for 30 plus years and I've never had anything in my compost. So it's the only thing I can think of is you've got to find a way to keep them out of there. But can't they come in from the bottom? I know the st stackables I've, I've worked with are, are open to the ground on the bottom. If there's a divot in there, they could go right. up that way. They could if, 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 they're, if it's not um, 
secure on the bottom. Yes, they could. Maybe some and mine rocks. kind of sit down because they're heavy. They eventually sink a little bit into the ground, and I haven't had that kind of a problem. Mm. So if she's picking them up and moving them and rotating, that would be an opportunity where they're not sinking in. So yeah, make sure exactly. the bottom's closed off. Mm -hmm. the, the tops are kind of wonky sometimes. So if you have a really wonky top that isn't, you can't make it be um, stable and secure, then I would put something over the top of the box mm -hmm. before you put the lid on. Um, uh, something probably smaller than chicken wire, probably mesh, would be small enough that they can't get through it. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest um, hardware cloth. Just yes. anywhere there's an opening, just line it on the inside with, with hardware cloth. Um, the other thing I was thinking for the top, uh, would a bungee cord work if you took a bungee cord and yep. fastened it down underneath the sides? Um, the other thing I'm, I'm curious, I wanted to toss this out to the others is uh, now you got to get the mice out. <laughs> so <laughs> any suggestions on that one? Shovel. <laughs> and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, those well, are baby they, mice. They so don't live very long without the mother. It said the mother escaped, so the babies won't live very long. Um, right. without a mother. Um, so I think it's kind of a mute point. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for the little mice. I know it's kind of sad to think about that. Mm -hmm. All right, what have we got now? All right, we have Julia who says she replaced some old jasmine shrubs with these a couple of years ago. One of these plants is really struggling. I'm not sure why. Well, let's take a look. Okay, and I'm starting on the assumption that it's the closest jasmine that is the jasmine of concern. So anyone have any jasmine experience to, um, to shed some light on this one? Well, this is a pretty easy jasmine to grow. Um, I wonder if there's concrete under there from the foundation. It's so close to the house that um, is making it unable for the roots to not be able to grow into the soil. Uh, could be a possibility. It looks yeah, Cindy, that was my dry, like it's not getting enough water. Mm. Or too much water. Yeah, this plant doesn't really need much water. I've seen it growing out yeah. in the bleakest of places, but maybe too much water. Well, I know as a, as a rule of thumb, if, you're, if your leaves are turning yellow the way these are turning yellow, and if you look really closely, if you zoom in on it, you can see that it has that typical chlorosis pattern where the inner vein is a still dark green and it's not. And that happens when the leaves aren't uptaking nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that could be because there's not the nutrients in the soil. It might be manganese or it might be iron or zinc even, um, or the soil might be too soggy and wet or the leaves or the roots could be damaged. Or as you pointed out, Cynthia, maybe you know they're just not getting into the soil or Cindy because of concrete down there. So somehow it's not taking up. Also, it could be um, it's too alkaline uh, because these jasmines like it a little on the acidic side. So I would recommend a soil sample to see are the nutrients there um, and what's the pH of the soil um, and to see if that's going. I don't personally think that it's iron because that looks like the yellow leaves are throughout unless all those yellow leaves are on the tip ends, in which case it would be iron. Um, deficiency. The plants on the right look okay. Um, mm -hmm. At the end, they, they look like they're thriving. Right, so that might argue against soil deficiency. Right, good point. Yeah, right. I, I, I agree with Cindy I, that when uh, she was saying it's like something to do with the environment and maybe something is underneath there and they just can't grow down since that is the only one that is, um, looks, you know, looks like it's not doing well. I also find myself wondering what the light conditions are. I wonder if it's possible that the two plants that are on the right of the photo that look healthier are getting more sun and that where the other two plants that are that look closer to us in this photo um, are get are shaded more um, and so the plant isn't getting the same amount of sun as the 
the other two plants? Mm -hmm. This plant doesn't really require, this plant will grow anywhere. I have it growing in shade and it's nice and green and. But, but wouldn't it be less full? It would be more airy in the shade than, and, and fuller in the sun, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't, and mine is not airy. Um, okay. I, I, I don't think it's light. I think it's something else. Um, these guys are tough. I agree, uh, very tough. Yeah, they grow anywhere. Sun, shade, they don't care. Is the questioner here? Who, what was it, Judy? Julia. Julia, yeah. If yeah. Julia's here, maybe we could unmute her and ask her. Yes, hi. Hi. Hi, Julia. So, hello. This is fascinating. So thank you all so much. Um, for giving this some thought. Um, the, uh, the jasmine that were planted here before were very old, but they were doing fine. So I, I think or hope that the concrete, whatever's underneath there is okay. Um, but I will scale back on the watering and I also am intrigued with the soil sample idea or finding a, a some sort of a, a way to um, put more iron into the soil? Yeah, don't, don't put more iron until you get a soil sample so you're not adding stuff and then getting an overdose. But do check, I think the idea of the roots is important. Something might be happening with the roots. It might be overwatering or compressed soil. If, it's, if it was stood on and trampled while the other one was taken out and the new one putting in, it might have compressed the soil. Um, but check the roots and see if they look white and healthy or if they look like um, like nematodes or even um, gophers or something have been eating them mm. uh, or you know so if the roots don't look healthy that's your problem and you just need to nurture it back to health with compost and loving care and not overwatering. okay um and can you recommend a place to get the soil sample done um, I think if you go online and um, put in um, soil sample in San Mateo County, okay. something will come up. There's, um, there's one called Soil Lab. It used to be called Soil Lab, and it was in San Jose, but someone bought them, but I think you can still Google Soil Lab. They're very good. I think there is something local, though. Um, if you mm -hmm. Google it, you'll, you should be able to find it. Um, okay. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, let's move on to the next question. And this is also from Julia. And this is about lemon and lime trees. These are wonderful old trees. What can I do to encourage more fruit? Okay, let's look at those. Um, I think we had a couple of suggestions here. Uh, number one, uh, the, the question would be how often you're fertilizing these plants, uh, citrus trees, require a lot of nitrogen. Uh, they could be probably fed every month or every other month from February or March through October. That's uh, probably a little late now. I wouldn't, wouldn't do it now. The other question I, I ha have in looking at these trees is how much they're being uh, pruned and how often they're being pruned. It looks kind of like a hedge. Someone had just used the clippers and, and cut everything back from the sidewalk from the patio. Uh, if so, you may be cutting off a lot of the, the new shoots that are coming out with the, the um, new leaves and the, and the flowers for the new fruit. You no, know, my lemon tree uh, flowers at least twice a year here in Atherton, um, sometimes three times a year. And if you cut off this, the branches before they fruit, um, you're cutting off the, the new babies. Yes, if, if, they're, if your gardener is keeping this well pruned, then he is pruning off uh, any flowers that might develop and you will not have lemons without flowers. The, the natural shape of citrus trees is kind of cascading. Uh, they grow up and then they kind of fall down. So some people might think that looks untidy and want to trim it all back to make it nice and hedgy looking. Um, think that might be uh, the issue here. 
But I will say the tree looks very healthy. Um, yes. The sub looks very healthy. There's no reason it shouldn't fruit. It's got to be lack of buds. Okay. Uh, I came across an additional fact in, in, in you know, um, just to add to this discussion, it's said to pick the fruit when, when, they're, when it's ripe because um, limes or lemons that become overripe on the branch potentially make the uh, following year's limes or lemons smaller, which I never knew that at all. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with the pruning question because the leaves are nice and green. So it appears to be getting fertilized. Um, but but I, I agree with all of you that it's possible the buds are being cut off. Great, thank you. This is actually, the picture is two trees, one lemon and one lime. But I'm going to um, pay closer attention to the pruning, maybe take it over myself so that um, I can do it in a more thoughtful fashion. I guess the only thing I would say is if you let these trees grow up as they need to, you're going to block your windows. So <laughs> you, you got to think about that. Which it's a kitchen window. It's right, right over the, the kitchen sink. So uh, I, I will think about that. Um, and I don't know to your point that, that they get fertilized very often. So I had bought some citrus fertilizer, some organic stuff, and I was, it's said to do it fertilize in the fall. But Cindy, you recommended it, um, not not now. I, if you do it right away, I think you could could um, fertilize it now. Make sure the soil is is uh, fully damp, completely watered before you put it down, and then water it in again, good after you put the fertilizer on it. Then I would wait until after our frost season before you fertilize it again. Okay. Yeah, what I what I always heard is you don't want to promote a lot of new growth uh, in the winter because that that's going to be more sensitive to cold and citrus are very sensitive to cold. Mm -hmm. So you want to ease off on the fertilizer until you, as Cindy said, you get past that and and it, and there's no danger of frost. I don't think you really need to fertilize. I think you're good until spring. Oh, I think good. so too. Shrub looks good. Good. Great, thank you, thank you all. Okay, thanks Julia, some interesting questions. Um, and what, what do we have next? All right, Thomas. When is the best time to plant my two-year-old avocado in the ground? What soil and sun would be best? How long before the tree will fruit? And I think we have pictures of that too. Okay. Well, so this... That, this is um, this is kind of a sad little plant. <laughs> um, it probably should have been put in the ground long ago. Um, when it first started to sprout, it could have gone into a six inch container and then eventually into the ground. Um, this plant will, if you plant this now, this plant will not produce fruit, if ever, but it'll be at least 15 years. Wow. Um, the, the avocado tree is not grown from seed in our nurseries. It's grown from stem cuttings attached to rootstock. Uh, makes for the avocado that you bought, that you got the seed from, that's how it was grown. So um, you're not getting the strongest type tree from growing from seed. It's fun, but it's not the way that growers grow it. Um, I would suggest that if you do plant this tree, um, that you go to the store and buy another um, avocado plant, if you really are serious about this, um, that is from rootstock and plant it, um, you know, a distance away from your, your tree, and you'll have a much better chance of getting fruit in the future. Um, they're, they're kind of funny little trees. They're both male and female and um, they need bees to pollinate them. So I wish you luck with this little guy. He looks like he's um, very um, starving for humidity. The brown leaves to me indicate that it's not getting enough humidity uh, in your house. It's, houses are very dry. Um, I would definitely plant them if you, you know, plan to keep them, put them in, plant them and see what happens. 
And how much sun should they get, Cindy? They need sun. Yeah, yeah. They um, need sun. I have a few. I have a few things I want to suggest. Um, it, since this, it sounds like this plant has been in this container for a couple of years, and um, anytime a plant is grown in a container, uh, it it needs it, after after a year or two, it can't get all the nutrients and things that it needs out of the soil anymore because the soil in the container is sort of used up and the nutrients are sort of used up. So um, one option, sometimes what people will do with an avocado that's sprouted from a seed this way is it becomes sort of a family indoor friend plant and they um, keep it indoors as an indoor plant. But uh, in, if that's the case, you would need to, to repot it. You need to lift it out of that pot um, tease out, use a toothpick, a chopstick or something and tease out some of the soil from away from the roots and then repot it freshly. And you might even prune maybe an inch, the outside inch of the roots away and then repot it with fresh soil that kind of gives it a fresh start and it gives the roots a little space to grow and then they can take up moisture better. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's one option is just to keep it as a potted plant, but give it um, kind of a fresh start as a potted plant since it's not likely to produce avocados. But I want to share with you guys, I don't know if you can see this. This is a wonderful, very old book. I'm sure it's out of print, but I think it can still be found occasionally in used bookstore websites. It's called The After Dinner Gardening Book. Um, and it, you can see the picture here is a lovely picture of someone's planted an avocado from a seed right there in the center, this one right here. Um, this is a very fun book for people who like to find a potato that's sprouting or find a citrus seed that they wanna see what happens if they put it in the ground and they're just sort of curious to try stuff from the various sources of sprouting that comes from your food. It's it's old, but it's kind of fun. So I just thought I'd mention that in case that's something that really intrigues me. Sounds you. like a good pandemic book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Thomas had another picture too, going back to Cindy's point about the, um, the, the leaves that were turning gray. So let's have that picture. Yeah, so is that what you meant, Cindy? Would, about? Yeah, I would say that that plant looks like its roots are uh, suffering. The way the plant is drooping and the, the brownness on the leaves, I, I'm, it looks like humidity issues. Um, and the soil looks hard and dry. And I, I just think that it's unhappy. Uh, I think Betsy's right. It needs to be repotted if you're going to keep it. OK. All right, thank you. And uh, what do we have next? Ah, <laughs> did we address the way to care for growing sprouts or not? Do you want to do a summary on that? Oh, there's his little little sprout there with the with the toothpicks in it. Yeah. Oh, well, I wouldn't plant it. You could probably put that in in a if it's when it starts to leave out, put it in a six inch pot, and uh, like Betsy said, just grow it as a house plant. Um, I don't think you would need two of these in the garden. Um, yeah, I, I was looking at... The, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, Cindy. I, I was looking at something from, um, from UC uh, ANR online, and it, it said you shouldn't plant that avocado seed in water. It should be in soil. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing it said is this is fairly typical for an indoor avocado plant they just get gangly and 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 lean because of light deprivation soil deprivation etc and I, I also agree with you about the humidity it's it's an outside plant it's not an indoor plant um, right so. it, and it it's more just sort of fun to for people to see to watch it sprout it's fun for people to experience watching that big seed Put up, put down roots, and put up a shoot. But um, and it's not, it, it won't produce great avocados for you. So yeah, if if what you're looking for is a 
tree that produces good avocados to eat, you want to start with one that's well chosen from a nursery. Okay. Yes, the fruit okay. that this plant will produce, if it does produce in 15 years, will not look anything like the Haas um, avocado that you started with. It'll be totally different mm. and not as delicious. And, right. and if you're really uh, interested in growing avocados, make sure you research the, the type. You, usually you do an A and a B tree. Uh, and and um, there's a lot of information about, you know, the, the types, the, the varieties you can uh, use for Northern California. So make sure that you really research if you want to grow good avocados. I speak from experience. <laughs> Trial and error. I had an avocado tree and I only had one. It was huge and it did have avocados. So um, it can self-pollinate, but um, more likely if there's two trees. It, it also can benefit from neighbors' avocado trees. And yeah. so sometimes when you have only one avocado tree, part it, you can have great success because by complete random good luck, there's a neighbor somewhere in close enough proximity who's got the other type of tree right. um, to help you. But there, there's there's like a new variety. It's called Wurtz or Little Cotto that's a smaller tree. And it um, it's, a little more, it's more successful at actually self-pollinating even if you only have one. It, mm -hmm. it can kind of cover all of its bases even with the AB thing and stuff. And nurseries I think are good at showing you where that, what that one is. So Thomas just left us a comment that said that his neighbors who have avocado trees. So maybe if he just goes down to the nursery and picks out a good specimen, he'll be more successful in having avocados. Yes, have, he'll have avocados in five years instead of 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Some of the nursery ones, you can get avocados in only, it only takes one or two years if, from some of the nice new varieties you can get in the nursery. Mm -hmm. But I think we could agree that this is not a completely in vain, although we have had a nice discussion about avocado torture and how not to do the seeds, but it at least is offering ox oxygen and as Betsy said, you know, a companion plant, so. And it's fun. It's just fun to watch it happen. So thanks for sending in those pictures. That, that was great. And let's see what we have next. Ah, this is a question from, I think from Master Gardeners because this is a question we get a lot. So uh, we thought we would address it here. And I think, um, Cynthia, this, this has to be you. Yes, and it can be Cindy Morris as well, because um, I don't know, I was redoing this whole yard uh, after I bought this house in, in uh, 2012, and then 2015, I became a master gardener, and I thought, well, I'm ready to tackle this. So uh, we have this, like, ugly, you can look in the top left picture. It was so ugly, full of weeds and oxalis and like it had like grasses here and there. I don't even know what was in there. And it was just um, an eyesore. So um, I, after researching a lot, I um, decided on Carapia, but I knew I had to do something with that hard soil before I started. So I did sheet mulching in that whole area. And in that picture on the left before, you can see all the little tiny bark because I wanted it to do its thing quickly. Uh, so that all the soil underneath the sheet mulching would, um, you know, would, you know, have worms and all kind of soil life. And so I waited, I waited and um, I planted the little plugs. I got, um, I got a good deal on plugs. I didn't want to buy the whole, um, you know, the whole grass things because it seemed so expensive. So I bought 72 plugs and I, and it, you can see there it started spreading. And then in, um, uh, actually it took about two years for all the sheet mulching to go. And then the rains came in the, in the um, February and, and um, January, February and March. And it just really took off and you can see how it grew after. And there, there it is in the summer of 2019, you can see that it's just, um, it looks like, you know, it looks good. I did have a lot of, um, oxalis growing in there but as the years have gone by I just kept pulling little oxalis I literally go sit down in it and pull 
And then I think I have one more slide just from this March. Was there one more slide? Yes. So that's how it looks now. It just, um, weeds are gone. I keep it trimmed with scissors, but I have a new little tool that I can, you know, cut around the edges and, and the, um, and the, the stones. And um, there we are, Karapia. I know Cindy, uh, I actually went, drove by her yard. I hardly knew Cindy at the time, but I drove by her yard with Melissa and uh, she showed me your Karapia. So you probably have something to add to this. Well, um, I love the Karapia. Um, I love it for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is because I really uh, like habitat gardens and this brings in so many honeybees. Um, my front yard is full of uh, um, insects, small butterflies, and I love that. If you don't want bees in your front yard by you know hundreds of bees in your front yard, um, then this is not what you want to plant. If you want something that the children can play on, this is not the plant for you. Um, Cynthia lives in um, on the coast, so she has a much cooler climate. Where I live, um, part of my cropia is in full hot sun, and that part of the um, landscape needs a lot more water than the cooler section on the other side. Um, and I do get some browning, so I do have to water. Um, so I guess I have really water. Re it's not, I water it more than I would like to, but to keep it green, I need to, to keep some water on it. You know, yeah. not, not like grass, but, uh, you know, two or three times a week. Yeah, it's, got a, it's yeah. got a taproot on it like this, doesn't it? Like Karapia? Well, Karapia, my Karapia grows pretty, it mounds into like mounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and then I cut it back once a year and, um, it can get pretty thick. Um, and so I have, I cut it way, cut it way back. The roots are deep, so you can cut it pretty low and it'll still come back. I think that this is, might be a different um, variety or, or, you know, cultivar or something because um, this one, or maybe it's just my microclimate because it just, um, it grows flatter. Um, and I have fewer bees and I really don't, honestly, I don't water it now. I just mm. let it go and it doesn't, it just, that's just how it looks. Mm. So I just it? don't know if it's a different, it might be from the, the type you have because it does look different from, from what yeah, I saw. Can get um, four or five inches tall. Uh, I do have to mow it once a year. Um, okay. And I do get lots and lots of flowers and lots of bees. Um, but it is a beautiful ground cover, um, but it is not a ground cover. At least mine is not one for children to play on. I see you have uh, yours next to your, your grandkids, um, little play equipment. Do you get right. a Yeah. I, you know what? I, for some reason there are, I don't, I might not have as many bees as you do. We do have lots of bees, but you know, the kids are always going up and down those stairs and we have never been, the bees have mm. never bothered us. I'll, mm. I'll stand out there and pull um, the, the few oxalis that are left and the bees for some reason don't bother us. I don't know why. You have the native, is this the native type or the Japanese type? It's the Japanese type. Yeah, that's what I have. It's, um, I, I don't it's know if I'm supposed more to- More sun, because um, mine is scorching hot out front. Oh, and mine is pretty hot. I mean, half moon, El Granada, we're on a slope and it's always yeah. sunny here. So <laughs> very I, interesting. Yeah, I think we're 10 degrees cooler than you are. Yeah. Well, and a lot anyway. higher humidity. Yes. A lot more humidity on the coast. Right. Mine tends to dry out. I have to water it to keep it green. So, um. so, so let's round it up with a, as an appropriate ground cover, if I understood you guys right. Um, it, it might be bigger and it might have more bees or it might be the, what, what uh, Cynthia has, but at any rate, it takes less water than your lawn. And I believe you can walk on it too. Maybe you couldn't play rugby on it, but I know the one I tend, it, I can trample on it pretty well. So it might be a great alternative to many of you who wanna replace your lawn and are looking for something that would also help our pollinators and be easy care. Okay, what else do we have? What is eating my lettuce? I don't see any caterpillars. 
Snails and slugs to begin with. Um, sparrows. Ah, uh, sparrows, yes. Well, it's it's my lettuce. And I don't have I don't have snails and I don't have any snails or slugs. Yeah, I don't see any slime. Um, but um, I thought maybe rats or something, but the rats would eat the whole plant. It looks like maybe a some kind of caterpillar or something, but I'm not seeing them on there. Well, the 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 sparrows get even if you have netting over it, and I don't know if you do. But the, the sparrows, unlike say pigeons or, or the bigger birds, they can crawl under and through and they're very, um, they're very sneaky and very clever. Um, they get under there and then they tear it. Like I'm looking at that bottom right tear. That's like, they take a little tear like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, damage. Yeah, so if you see sparrows around, then they're probably getting in there and, 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 it, and, they, and they've learned to love, I was just reading the other day that there's a big sparrow eating lettuce problem that didn't used oh. to exist. It's like the sparrows have discovered lettuce. Okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I have to say this one is this one is mine and I was hoping someone could help me uh, because I got this at the San Mateo Arboretum and it's a beautiful little begonia I put it about six, seven feet away from a southwest window, but it's never bloomed, but it looks healthy. Well, I collect begonias and um, this is leggy. Begonias aren't usually this leggy. Ah. This begonia is not getting enough light. Ah. Um, what I would do, um, Susan, is I would in the summer, next summer, put this outside mm -hmm. and put it in a, like a morning light or in on the coast, you could probably just put it almost anywhere. And um, I would clip that top off. Oh, good. I was wondering about that. I would clip the top off and maybe, you know, propagate it and start another one. Because um, it's because like, I thought I can't even carry it outside anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely leggy. And um, the leaves are beautiful and green because um, begonias do grow in the shade but um, they do need some light to bloom. Okay. Uh, um, Susan, I was also going to uh, suggest, um, you know, uh, carefully looking at your potting soil, what it was originally potted in to see what kind of nutrients is, it is, because I know that uh, for begonias, too much nitrogen uh, causes, the, causes the plant to uh, grow more leaves and not flower. So if you might, you know, take a look at the soil you originally potted it in, I don't know, you know, if you had a bagged, bagged soil or, or whatever it was, but it could also be too much nitrogen that causes very beautiful leaves, but no, no flowers. Well, that makes sense because I think I took some um, handfuls of garden soil and a handful of compost and maybe a little bit of potting soil on hand. Uh, I'm very careless about this kind of stuff, but my yeah. compost, I put a lot of uh, coffee grounds in it. So that, I mean, uh, composted co coffee grounds, but that would be a lot of nitrogen, I suppose. That would be, yeah, probably too much nitrogen for, for a begonia. We never use garden soil with house plants. Why That's not? another tip. It's what? Don't use garden soil or house plants. Use potting soil. Mm. Because of, because of the you're texture? Bringing in, you're bringing in all the, whatever's in the potting soil, you're bringing it in your home. Um, yeah, oh, good point. You don't wanna do that. Okay. All right, so um, I think those are all the questions. Maggie, you've been yeah. looking at that chat box. What have we got? Yes, okay, so we need to jump back to the avocado plant. Um, the person who submitted the question, um, unfortunately, was not able to join us right at the beginning. So um, uh, he missed the uh, recommendations and sort of analysis of what you all did. So his question is, um, could you please summarize? That's one. And then um, as part of that, he would like to know what type of soil and light do the avocado plants need to grow and want to know where to plant it in the garden? All right, Cindy, you want to summarize all that? Okay, well, uh, um, okay. Um, avocados that are grown outdoors um, that we harvest avocados from are not grown from seed. They're grown from cuttings, um, wood, wood stem cuttings, grafted onto rootstock. 
um, that makes for a healthy, a strong avocado. Um, the avocado that you have in this pot will probably, if it ever blooms or uh, produces fruit, will be 15 years. It also is very uh, dehydrated looking. Um, it is recommended that if you're going to keep it indoors, that you repot it. Um, and and um, if you do take it outdoors, um, I think someone said you have a neighbor that has an avocado tree. That would be very helpful in pollination. That's kind of a summing up of it, but um, you're not gonna have real good luck with this avocado outside, I don't think. And the little one, I wouldn't even pursue it any further. Maybe grow it for fun and then dispose of it. Um, unless you wanna keep it for a house plant. Okay. Thank you. And we have some more questions, I guess. We do, we do. Um, okay, so I have uh, two different questions um, that are um, about iceberg, ro iceberg roses. And um, uh, one is, they're submitted by different people. Uh, one is, um, I have been growing iceberg shrub roses for about six years. And some of the canes are the diameter of small trees. <laughs> to encourage new shoots, how do I prune slash cut off these old canes? Well, if you're going to cut old canes, you have to cut them from, and you want to get rid of them, you cut them from the bottom. Well, you don't want them to regrow. And you wouldn't maybe just, just pick, if you have, say, two of those big honkers, you know, take one of them out. Well, you want to get some fresh new growth and you can get that by taking taking one out and maybe you know leaving them so i think a th a, take a third of the canes out is okay and I, I think you want to make sure that the plant is growing in a v shape the way the sunlight gets down in the inside so if you have a lot of um canes that are crossing or close together in the center those would be the ones i would cut out first yeah they shade each other Mm -hmm. or, or they're crossing, they're rubbing on each other, those yeah. I would cut out first. You can cut them back uh, in January when you would normally trim back roses. Um, and I think that would be the, the plan. And, and it, I don't think it's necessarily all that bad on those icebergs to have to have big old can big old mm -hmm. uh, canes like mm -hmm. that either. You just keep cutting them back. But if it starts to not produce as well, and that'd be quite so beautiful with the flowering and the foliage, then I would take, you know, take take one out and let something new come out. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question um, uh, about iceberg roses. Um, I'd like some suggestions for getting iceberg shrub roses to thrive. I planted some in the spring and they are limping along. Well, roses like full sun, like good drainage, need to be fed. Um, and a first year rose might not be that prolific, but next year it might be great. That's right. Um, pruning it in the winter would be good. And you know, don't let you know prune back, prune off anything that's um, that's a pencil size or smaller for sure. And, and there's lots of um, places where you can go and observe uh, pruning of roses. Uh -huh. uh, Master Gardeners, the Rose Society, uh, San, San Mateo Arboretum—they all have classes on pruning roses. So you could go to one or all, and you'd get lots of instruction on how to do that. In fact. In fact, we have our own rosarian giving a rose, was it, someone said a rose um, pruning demonstration at the San Mateo, oh no, on Zoom, but he'll be at the San Mateo Arboretum on January, like the second Sunday in January. The 10th, I believe. Yeah, the 10th at um, 12, I think. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, the Arboretum would have that information, so would Master Gardeners. All right. Anything right. else? Yes. Um, um, we have another question. Um, and uh, this is from the person with the avocado, but it's a different question. We are looking for a fast growing shrub or bush that is native and would grow in Portola Valley for screening along our property line that would also be pretty. 
I how, vote for hot lip salvias. How tall do they? They don't they grow that big though, do they? Could you, do they say how tall they want the shrubs to be? Does not say. It says- the Toyons um, are really nice, would be a nice yeah. order. Toy, did you say Toyons? Yeah, toy I vote for Toyons. Or coffee berry for a lower shrub. Um, and coyote bush, you can get some big ones. They grow really fast and they're trouble free, but they're not really pretty. No, um, they're not. But the, coffee, the toyon is very pretty, gets berries, very beautiful plant. Beautiful for your native ecology, the toyon. And also the ceanothus, some of those are pretty fast growing. I know I have Julia Phelps and they got really big within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So the preferred height would be about six feet. Yeah, that the Julie Phelps. Then, then you're looking for ceanothus or something mm -hmm. like that. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the tall ceanothus. You, you have to pick the right ceanothus because there's so many, but you want to look for a yeah. tall one or the toyon would do well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A request to say the type of plants a little bit more slowly. Um, <laughs> so it's a little bit hard to understand. So just repeat those recommended plants would be most appreciated. There is uh, the toyon. Toyon, okay. Uh, you know, y -O -N. Go ahead, Cindy. I'm just going to spell it out. So it's T O Y, toy on O N. Um, coffee berry and Ceanothus. And there is a native plant garden center in Half Moon Bay along Highway. Um, 92. 92. 92. Yeah. And they might be able to help you if you want a native plant. Um, yes. Or, you know, help you with the shrub for that. It's in the complex where it's pastorinos and there's a no number yeah. of different little um, small shops right. all clustered together. Yes. There, and there's and another I, very nice I, resource. Oh, sorry. There's a very another another very nice resource, which is the Woodside Public Library. Since you're in Portola Valley, you're close enough to the Woodside Public Library. And in the back of the Woodside Public Library is a beautiful native garden where, and the, the plants are labeled. So you can see examples of the plants growing and get a sense of what they're like. And they have a beautiful red berried toyon right next to a golden berried toyon. Ooh. And when you see the berries, it's just beautiful to see the two different colors of berries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both the toyon and the ceanothus are very good for our, our native ecologies. Both are real anchor plants. So um, yeah, two, two good suggestions for you. Okay, um, we have um, another question. We have a question about tomatoes. Um, I have what I think is fusarium wilt in raised beds of tomatoes. The soil was new when Mm. Oh, oh, I dear. just lost the chat view. Okay, the soil was new um, when we planted the tomatoes, so we don't know where it came from, but how to get rid of it. Pull it out, <laughs> throw it away. Yeah, and you're done for this year. Uh, this is the oh. end of the season. I would get rid of it, get it out of there. I would compost the soil very well. Then next year, when it's when you plant tomatoes in your raised beds, you need to make sure that the bottom 18 inches or so of the tomato plants, you trim off the leaves, off the stems, because you fusarium wilt comes from the soil, and base, usually it gets there because you water it, we hand water it, uh, or it rains, and the water drips down to the soil and then bounces back up onto the leaves. Then you get the wilt in the leaves and it works its way up through the plant. I, prove, I grow about 25 tomato plants a year and have for the last 30 years. And the, the way I prevent that in my garden is I, I try to keep the, the leaves trimmed up on the plant for the bottom foot to 18 inches. And then if you have the drip, it doesn't hit the leaves, it doesn't go into your plants. Hmm. It stay, the fusarium stays in the soil it can stay for years. Yes. So, so how if it's already in the soil when you plant your tomatoes, how do you, how do you, or what do you do with the soil to minimize the risk of fusarium? Compost. Put down mulch on top so that it, again it doesn't splash onto your leaves. Does it come up through 
the roots? No, it splashes onto the leaves. Interesting. So the, the another another thing I'll just toss out there is that there are some varieties of tomato that are mm -hmm. fusarium wilt resistant, and mm -hmm. and those will have an F1 in parentheses after the name of the variety. So um, you, you can try that. Okay, that's good advice. All right, there's a comment um, about the native plantings. Um, Laura Jean says, thank you so much. Your suggestions are amazing, especially like being able to go and see them. Thank you so much, it's very helpful. All right, so we are caught, I think we're caught up with the questions. Uh, let me just go back here and make sure that I've captured, because some people did have several responses. Um, we've got the avocados, yep. All right, okay, so. Oh. Oh, sorry, Maggie. Yeah. So, did the avocado know. person see about this book? Oh, because oh. it's just, if you're someone who just wants the encouragement of having the fun, of sprouting something. You know, you can have a lot of fun sprouting things and watching them grow as long as you understand that you're not gonna have high expectations of them becoming fruit producing things. It's just kind of fun to have plants that are sprouting and growing and you learn from them. And then they reach a point of maturity where it's okay to let them go and you sprout something new and that you can have fun with it. Okay, so I think that, um... Now would be a really good time to indulge ourselves in the aforementioned garden chat. <laughs> so, and there might be people out there who are facing the same questions and maybe that will spark more questions in case, in, in that case, we're happy to entertain them. But I'm wondering what you guys are doing right now in your garden. What needs attention? I know that I've just gone out and cut down my lion's tail and, uh, and finally got to my hydrangeas and doing general cleanup, but now some other plants are, are taking off beautifully. The beautiful, um, um, what do you call that? Um, Mount lemon marigold with its beautiful scented yellow flowers. It's coming into glory. So I have to clear clear a path for it. <laughs> what about you guys? What are, what, what are your gardens up to? Um, I think, think that we need to encourage people to leave the leaves mm. in their garden for the winter time. Um, it's a very important place for a uh, habitat. For example, um, swallowtails, their chrysalis look just like wrinkled old dried up brown leaf. And if you sweep up everything and take it all out, you're, you're taking out the butterflies too. Good point. I think that's a general rule. You know, people have, um, People want their gardens to be fastidious and well manicured, and you really don't do your garden any good by doing that. Um, there are certain places that you need, you know, if you have diseased leaves or something, you need to clean it up. But I let all my, everything that falls in my garden stays on the soil. And um, it, I have a very thick carpet of green in the backyard, and it's too thick, it's too tall and big to mulch. And so I let it self mulch uh, just by using the leaves uh, from the plants themselves and the trees. And so don't I, be stupid. <laughs> I, I, I just want to clarify if you do have fruit trees, however, I think you do want to clear out the, the leaves from around the bottom because that's a good way for disease to get yeah, in. In roses also. So just Clear, clear it away around the drip drip line, like a foot or so mm -hmm. ar around um, the trunk of the tree. And roses also, you want to clean around roses also, because mm -hmm. their leaves are always diseased by the time they fall. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, if you're growing uh, vegetables, if you have vegetable beds, um, we saw the photograph of the tomatoes and somebody said, take those tomatoes out. R really, um, all your summer crops, if they're not out now, get them out, um, and compost them. Um, it's a little late to put in a cover crop. So, you know, add a little organic fertilizer, um, add a two, three inches of organic compost. 
um, and just, you, you know, just uh, let it sink in over, over the winter. Mm -hmm. I agree with Jonathan, Jonathan, just cleaning up everything and putting in more compost in the raised beds and everything. I just got through doing that in the last two weeks. And um, when I do this every year, I just have such a great crop in the spring and, and plants just grow so well when you prepare now and, and let the soil do its thing over the winter and, and through our rains. I do want to, um, yeah, so from my perspective, it's, it's pretty quiet at this point because the, you know, all the summer crops are out, the, the cover crops are in, stuff like that. I, I will use this opportunity to put in a plug for a couple of wonderful fruit trees. Um, at this time of year, persimmons look beautiful mm -hmm. um, because you got these beautiful orange globes on them and they're, this is just about, you're getting close to persimmon picking time and persimmons are a great fruit. They grow really well here. Um, and then the other fruit tree that you're watching at this time of year is, is pomegranate. If you, if you grow pomegranate, that too is a wonderful fruit. Um, so, you know, not all fruit trees are picked uh, over, the, over the summer. Yes, and I just finished my figs, so um, late yeah. summer. Yeah, me, me and me and the squirrels did. Yeah, the squirrels helped me. <laughs> I have to share. <laughs> While you're talking about figs, um, how do you prune your figs? I prune mine all the way back. Uh, I don't want my tree to get big. Um, so I, I prune it back pretty severely um, every year. Like how far back? I prune it all the way back to the, um, to the junction. Mm. Oh, wow. They're um, they're basically glorified weeds, in in my opinion. Mm -hmm. They'll they're really hardy trees. They grow like crazy. Yeah, that's why I prune hard. Mm -hmm. And 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 they don't really grow in a. They're very rangy. They don't they don't grow in a very you know controlled way. So I think Cindy's suggestion about being pretty aggressive with your pruning is probably a good idea. Nothing will grow under it anyway. So shade it out. Oh. I hang orchids from my um, fig tree. I, I have um, mounted orchids and orchids in wood baskets. And I hang uh, orchids in the summer from my fig tree. Mm. And by the end of the summer, you can't see the orchids anymore. There's so many leaves on the fig tree. <laughs> well, that's good because I have a client with a couple of figs, but they're just big and like you're saying, rangy, like sprawling arms yeah, going. Really cut them, yeah. yeah. So cut they'll them without back. fear. They'll grow back. Very good. Uh, does anybody grow Cape gooseberries? Do you uh, cut those also down to the ground? Cape gooseberries, you know, uh, ground cherries? Do you have? I, um, I don't know about those. Okay. I know they grow them at Elkus and I got my, um, my start from Elkus. So I was just wondering if I cut it all the way back. Mm. Seems like I might. Those are very tasty. I know that from Elkus. Mm. Yeah, beautiful plant. Yeah. So I have a I have a question. Um, I I have two large pots out in front of my um, bay window that have um, blue agave in them, and they've become they are filling the pots. I mean, I'm afraid they're going to burst the pots, and I'm I'm a little bit concerned about how to get thin them out. <clears throat> I mean, they're these great big things, right? Great big blue agaves. So any suggestions about what to do other than wearing armor, armor gloves and, you know, <laughs> mail? <laughs> Peggy, I have, um, I have three pots full. They're not blue agave. Uh, they're like actually Americanas and they've grown very, very large. Um, I read that, okay, so I have these, they're very, very thick, big uh, yellow clay pots from uh, Linkso. So mm -hmm. I, and they're growing all these pups too. I have like clipped off all of the stickers. So when I try mm. to get in there, uh, I use my hori hori knife and uh -huh. I tried to get in there and I've, you know, cut off some with a hori hori knife. I think you've got to get those pups before they get too big. Oh, it's um, really out of, it's, they're, 
Oh. Like I said, I'm afraid they're going to burst the pot. Are, are your pots sturdy? Are they ceramic? They're, stur they're sturdy, but I, I, these things are, they're like aliens, you know? They. Oh, <laughs> you know what I've decided, because it's lo a lot of work to get in there with a hori hori knife and, and cut. Uh, I have decided I'm going to let them go and just see what happens because, <laughs> you know, they're beautiful, right? I think yeah. they're really beautiful. So I'm just letting mine grow um, and see. I'm just going to let them grow and do their thing. And well, they'll bloom eventually, won't they? Won't they bloom eventually and die? I don't know. I don't know. If mine, I've never seen them blooming. Yeah, I've seen them. It takes a long time for them to bloom, yeah. but I think that's what happens. After yeah. 15 or 20 years, I mean, they oh. bloom like and then they die. Yeah. Huh. It bloom looks like a tree when it blooms. Mm -hmm. huh. well, I'm just letting mine go. I don't know what anybody else would do, but I'm <laughs> going to let them be. Don't plant them. <laughs> <laughs> they do spread for sure. Yeah, I like the idea of snipping off the pointy parts so I can at least maybe get in there and see what's going on. Yeah, That's yeah, snipping off the points are is a yeah. really good thing. Yeah, I've seen people wrap cardboard around them too when they have to, you know, replant them. Uh huh. So that they don't get uh, stuck and. Yeah. All that. Yeah. And I have those long leather gloves now. Yeah. I, have I have learned from being poked so many times. Yes. For roses and, and, and cacti, it's a good practice. Yes, no question. Yeah. Now, have you ever been to the Ruth Bancroft garden out in Walnut Creek or Pleasant yeah. Hill? A long time ago. Because yeah. they have some they have some really wonderful uh, plants like that too to go look at. And if there's gardeners out there, you can chat with them too. Oh, that's a good idea. And it's open. Yeah. Yeah. And they sell plants. <laughs> okay. I, another question I have, since I have you guys all to myself here. Oh, I um, see Peggy has a question too. Oh, Peggy. Peggy. Okay. Um, I usually let my leaves fall. This year, I had a ground wasp nest. Oh, and my thinking it was because I let the oak leaves fall in that area. I'm wondering if I should do a light raking to keep wasps from nesting? What do you think? Mm. Are you sure it was wasps and not yellow jackets? Yeah, wasps usually are high. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Sorry, yellow yeah. jackets, yellow I- jackets. It was yeah. yellow Sorry. Yeah. Nasty. Very, I had to call, you know, the experts to come in and do a big spring and it was terrible. Yeah. yeah. Did you say they were yellow jackets, Peggy? Yeah. Yes, they were yellow jackets. Okay. I, I, I ran into that at a client's place and, and they swarmed me and I got several, you know, bites. It was, it was they're horrible. nasty. Mm -hmm. the, the yellow jackets tend to either um, nest in the ground, usually in gopher holes or something like that, mm -hmm. or in sides of the building where they can get in in the sides. Wasps, as Cindy Moore says, are usually way up high on some kind of a structure. Um, Best thing to do if you have yellow jackets in your yard is to contact the county of San Mateo. They have a group that will come out and they'll they'll take care of it. They'll spray it, come back if they have to, and there's absolutely no cost to you whatsoever. Mm. So I would call the county of San Mateo if you see yellow jackets anywhere. You can usually see them early in the spring is when the queens go out and um, mate and then start a, a hive. And then when they start to leave the ground, you can see them uh, one at a time leaving the nest. And so if you walk around in the early morning, uh, you can usually see where you have them. I, I have a large property. And so we usually, we usually get at least one every year. So I'm very experienced Whoa. with this, <laughs> um, but uh, as I said, the county will come out and take care of it for you for no charge. They're usually there within a day or two. So that it's very safe and I highly recommend it. There, do you think it has any connection with the leaves um, no. collecting? Okay. No. No. Okay, that's Just, good. That's what I was wondering if it's, you know, worth, you know, disturbing all of the leaves and what they're doing no. to keep the wasps out of the yard. Nope. No, oh, it's, it's it, it really it's, need their leaves. Yeah, and as Cindy said, it's, it has more to do with when the yellow jackets find a hole 
or, or something already there. But um, I have experienced having the county come out and remove a yellow jacket ground nest. And then the following year, a new colony, a new group of yellow jackets um, got a new nest started fairly nearby. And so I think that there was still a little bit of a hollow. There was still a little hole in the ground and they, they came back. So um, that's the one thing I would suggest is kind of keep an eye on that area so that if you notice a new nest of yellow jackets starting, you can call the county when it's early, when it's smaller, because of course it's easier for everybody and the environment if they take care of it when the nest is smaller rather than waiting until it's really big and developed. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with the kind of weather we get in the wintertime. Colder it is, the more frost we have, less likely we are to have new yellow jackets the next year. When we have a winter like last year, where it was very warm, actually very warm during some of those months, it really encourages them early on and then you get the residual. Yeah. Um, I, I will also add that one thing that I actually really valued in interacting with the and it's the vector control it's county it's the San Mateo County vector control correct um and one thing that I really valued is that they will be very um clear with you that yellow jackets are not all bad there are beneficial aspects of yellow jackets that when what makes them problematic is if they are located in a place where they're likely to create a hazard for people because they're in a pathway or someplace where people are, are vulnerable to being stung. But if the yellow jacket nest is not in an area where people would necessarily be bothered by it, um, and it doesn't put people or dogs, for instance, at risk, um, the vector control people are very good about saying, you know, this is a nest we should just leave be because these guys can do good things for us if they are, if they have enough space and they're not in a pathway where they're intersecting with places where people and dogs go. So, and I appreciate that about vector control that they, you know, they, they take an IPM approach an integrated pest management approach to the way they handle it, but they, they are, it's a fantastic service. Thank you. Thank you. And, all. and I, and I am very anti-pesticides generally. So. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other topics you guys wanted to bring up or have we have we done it for I guess I guess one the only thing I would add is um, if if you do have vegetable beds um, right now and, and fruit trees, um, until the rain starts, you gotta keep irrigating. You know, nor, mm -hmm. usually at this time of year, it's starting to rain. You can really dial back the irrigation or stop the irrigation completely. But until we get some rain, you, you, you've you got to keep irrigating anything that's growing. Thank you. It's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. I have a question uh, for you all. Uh, if you have experience with as asparagus, I'm growing two beds of um, asparagus and this is the second year and I have beautiful ferns. You know, I know you're supposed to uh, let it go for a couple of uh, years and then you might have asparagus. So um, do I cut off those ferns or just leave them through the winter? I let them come out full, uh -huh. bloom, if you will. Then I cut them, cut them back. Okay. To you need to also make sure you fertilize them really good. They're another real heavy feeder. Okay. And do I cut them back to the ground, Cindy? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Hmm. Hey, I, I, since we got time um, and all these experts online, I'll toss something out. So I have a place in my front yard um, that's been a strawberry bed for, for years. And um, I mean, it's not, it's not huge. It's, it's, you know, maybe a little over, a, over a foot wide and, you know, maybe eight feet long or so. Um, and I've got a, I planted a, a Japanese maple uh, between that and the house. And 
it's it, it, at this point there's not enough sunlight anymore for the strawberries to be growing really well and fruiting really well. So I'm going to replace those strawberries with something um, th this winter, and I, I don't think it's going to be something edible. Um, but I'm just looking for suggestions. This is um, I, I, I'm looking for something relatively low. Um, and it's in an area that gets, you know, some sunlight in the morning, but after that, it's just, it's just shaded by the Japanese maple tree. Well, Japanese maple have very sensitive roots. And they're very close to the surface yeah. the soil. So I think you have to make sure it's outside of the drip line of the, of the uh, maple tree. So that may considerably cut back the area that you have to plant. I'll, I'm just going to suggest that um, if you like the look, the look of the strawberries that are there, there are um, native strawberries and also European woodland strawberries that um, they're not going to give you lots of big, big strawberry fruits to eat. Although the European woodland strawberries, they're very tasty, but they're tiny. Um, but they don't need as much sun and they actually make a ground cover that I think is very pretty. Um, and if you, as Cindy said, if you, if you start them far enough away from the trunk of the tree that you're out, you know, you're at, at the drip line or out, so you're not interfering with what the Japanese maple's roots need, they'll spread themselves and kind of fill that space and they'll spread towards the tree as close as they can compatibly work with the roots, but then they won't, you know, they'll, they'll, I think they're lovely and they don't need as much sun. Some of them will, are at my condominium complex, they're thriving in shade, mm. both the native ones and the European um, woodland ones. That's good. And you might also think about um, maybe bulbs and succulents together. Mm -hmm. And that way you have some some sort of color and you have the the changing bulbs that might come in like the autumn and the springtime crocus as well as your other favorite um, bulbs and then stick some some succulents in there and they'll just root easily without disturbing the maple. maple. Yes, I was going to suggest succulents also. Uh, it would be very pretty. Yeah, be really nice. So we do have another question from um, our 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 attendees. Um, this person would like to know what to do about soil that appears to shed water. The plants are not getting watered because the water doesn't seem to soak in at all. Uh, I think you've got compacted soil. And when it's compacted, there's not like tiny little oh, what it pores for the water to go into. So the water just runs off, but luckily you have a solution probably close at hand, which is to get compost and cover that with, with several inches of compost. The microbes in the compost will work their way into the soil. The earthworms will want to come and eat those microbes. And then they make little channels and pores and stuff. But, the, but all that work is going to open up your soil. So it, it um, you know, I don't know what your soil it is, if it's more clay or if it's just a mix. But at any rate, um, loosen it up through compost. Don't till it. That, do, do not till it. Do not dig down in there. Just sprinkle it out on top, a couple inches deep, and just let it sit there for the winter. Yeah. Could the com could the compaction be caused by also uh, by, by by leaf blowers or traffic or? It can be caused yes. by nothing more than sun and rain, really. And if you're also the compaction, can be it. caused by walking on it a lot. It can, but it can also be. When your gardener blows your garden um, and they blow in your garden, they're blowing your topsoil off uh, quite often. So, and disturbing things. So that can compact your soil also. That's right. And if you put down compost or leaves, then the leaf blowers blow all that off. So the instruction I always want people to give is, no blowing in the flower beds. Right. 
Yeah. If you have to blow in the in the hardscape or the lawn, blow it into a pile and remove it carefully. Mm -hmm. And, and if you need be, you can sprinkle it around in the flower beds. If you if you drive down the areas where, where people don't have sidewalks, you can see where people have used leaf blowers for years. And the soil there is like cement. Mm -hmm. Nothing, not even weeds grow in there anymore because it's so, so firm. But leaf blowers are the worst thing you can do to your soil. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the worst things. <laughs> Yes, I'm just going to mention um, if, if you're adding when you're adding compost um, to your soil, which is the very best solution, um, you, you can also um, if you're if you're putting it right near where you have trees or woody shrubs, uh, I just want to warn you that you you want to leave it a few inches away from a woody, any woody trunk, a woody shrub or a woody tree. You don't want to mound the compost up around the base of that trunk. So, so give your give the if you're putting it right around a plant, just give the plant three or four inches of of space where the the compost is not mounded up on it. That's all. Um, and you can also just you can use a thin layer of compost. Like if you go to a garden store and you feel like a bag of compost that you buy from a gardening store is, is expensive, you can use um, a, a thinner layer of compost and then a, a little bit of um, our bark, like chips from an arborist or something on top of the compost. And that adds another layer that just helps protect the soil. Oh, I, and I'd like to add to that, Betsy, to say that when you look about putting on a mulch and you want a wood mulch, which is, which is good, um, if you use the bark, I like, I think Cynthia said, use the very smallest one because it'll decompose um, or use wood chips, I think are even the best because they will decompose and feed the soil. Um, if you think about it, bark is made to repel water and repel bacteria and microbes. And so you, you, you wanna invite moisture and invite, invite microbes in. So, um, right. so the arborist mulch, like you said, Betsy, that's the best because it has a mixture of green and twigs and wood and it has some bark and that's good too. But um, yeah, you wanna, you wanna invite deco decomposition, not say, oh good, it's not gonna decompose. You want it decomposing. Right, right. Okay, Great. so um, Maggie, thank you for that. Okay. Have, we, have we covered everything, Maggie? I think we've got uh, all of the questions answered. Okay, yep. that's great. So um, I wanna thank I want to thank all of you who've joined us today with your interesting questions and giving us, I guess, an audience so that we can talk about our favorite stuff. That's cool too. Uh, but before we go, I'd like to share uh, some of my favorite reference books. And uh, if you have your, your phone camera or something, you can probably take a picture of this next slide. Next it looks like slide. Anne might have a question. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't, I see that someone has raised their hand, but I don't see um, on the chat. Um, I think Anne, Anne Colbrick. Yes, yeah. yeah. Speak yeah. up, Anne. I'm very interested in purchasing an avocado plant, but I would like to know, um, after I put it in the ground, and possibly this is a good time, uh, what is the care of the plant, kind of roughly? Well, avocados, I believe, like acidic soil. So you want to feed it an, an acidic type uh, fertilizer and, and use an acidic soil. Um, other than that, I don't know about the water requirements for an avocado. I would think that it needs to be watered until it's established, yeah. and then you can ease up on the water. But um, I would ask your nurseryman when you purchase the plant um, to make sure that you get the correct instructions, unless someone else uh, knows about, about it. I'm just looking up on the Sunset Garden book to see if I can find what it says for avocados. <laughs> I would advise against like getting a bag of acidic like camellia azalea soil and putting it in the ground and putting your, your avocado in it because you are likely to have a, uh, a soil differential. And if that mm -hmm. potting mix 
is light and airy and it's in, and you're putting it in a heavier soil, the water that you do feed, it will go right through that potting mix, the, the acidic camellia mix, and then puddle up on top of that clay and you'll get a perched wa water table, which can then cause root rot. So um, just use added, um, you know, added fertilizer to, for the acidic component, not a soil amendment. And, and okay. I would pay attention This is to what the Sunset Garden book has to say uh, <laughs> avocados needs. Uh, drainage, make sure it's good, avoid clay soil, high water table in rainy season, and kill a tree even in well-drained soil. Watering, keep soil moist but not wet with light, frequent sprinkler irrigation. Go heavy every third or fourth time to wash out excessive salts. Let fallen leaves build up under the tree as mulch. Fertilizing, feed young trees lightly. Mature trees need one pound of actual nitrogen per year split into two applications, one in spring, one in summer. Control chlorosis, the iron or zinc uh, chelates. Uh, pollination, combine a type A bloomer with a type B for best fruit production. There you go. There you go. Everything you need to know. <laughs> so it sounds like I need two plants if I have need a male and a female. Or a neighbors, some or more couple neighbors that have avocado trees. It yeah. gives you a better odd, it gives you better odds for production fruit production. Yeah. yeah that's small get fruit production, but the odds are better if you have two. And and it'll tell you what kinds of um, what species or cultivars to buy if you just Google California Northern California A and B type avocados. I've I've recently uh, looked at looked all that up. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your help. Yeah. And and I'm just gonna throw in one of my um, favorite topics, which is <laughs> to point out that when you plant a tree you want to be careful not to plant it too deep. There are some good, um, I was just, I can't seem to find it right now, but there are a couple of good pictures you can find online that I think the, um, the UC Davis Arboretum has a good little page in their Arboretum All-Stars section. But there are other places I know Canopy in Palo Alto also has a good description. When you plant a tree, you want to be sure that you don't plant it too deep. And there are pictures, you know, building on what um, Susan had to say, there are good descriptions that explain the process to use so that you don't, you don't wanna dig the hole too deep, you wanna dig it wide, not deep, and you wanna use the native soil um, so you're not doing you know, what Susan advised you to avoid. And, um, but you, you definitely wanna know that the, the, where the trunk transitions into roots, that little transition area needs to be really up high and not buried under the soil. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very common mistake. And sometimes when you buy a tree at the nursery, it's already too deep in the pot. Um, and so that's just a, a really good thing to be aware of that um, I tend to say a lot because it's, it's so common that people don't have any idea about it. And that, after, is so, and, that is so important, Betsy. I know, you know, without that root flare showing, you know, you've got the root crown under the soil and it's going to, it's going to rot. And a lot of people wonder why their trees are failing and it just gradually fails over time. There's not mm -hmm. one thing, it's just gradually failing. And if you look at that tree, it's like straight down into the ground and it, you have a buried root, root crown, I mean a crown. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. And people don't realize that in the uh -huh. nursery, it may be already too deep in the pot and yeah you know, and typically it's too deep in the pot from a nursery you have to adjust it you have when to you kind of find yeah you have to pull very gently pull some of that soil away so just um be aware of that and um find a good picture that helps you understand how to do that and i know canopy in palo alto has some really good information on their website about um good good practices for playing a tree so you have real success Thank you very much. And you need to keep you need to keep in mind that after you've planted it in soil that's been dug up or poured in there or whatever, it's all going to sink. So you need to plant it up even higher, keep it from sinking as that soil 
unpacks itself. Thank you. Very good advice. Very good advice. Very, very excellent. Okay, so we are now actually out of time. So if we could zoom on to the list of books. These are some reference books that I think we all find very, very handy. If you have your phone or a camera, uh, why don't you just take a, a quick picture of that. All of these books are readily available. The Problem Solver book is out of print, but it's easily found um, online as a used book. So these are sources I know all of us Master Gardeners use. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank you for coming. I want to get a special shout out and thanks to the San Mateo Arboretum. They have partnered with us in this uh, plant clinic for a long time. And I look forward to once again, holding forth under the beautiful roses there. So I hope to see you there. And finally, there are several ways to talk to master gardeners other than in this. And here's another opportunity for a picture. We have a helpline. You can call it and talk to Master Gardeners or you can email it with your questions and pictures and they will get back to you. Um, so please join us on, on social media or call us there. And I'd like to wish you all um, happy gardening and enjoy Aww. the rest of Sunday. Thank you very, very much. This Thank was you. most informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And are you, when's the next call? And will we get an email notifying us of the next call? Uh, yes, I think we're going to skip December because, you know, December. So it will probably be second or third week in January. We have to check with a, a few other people on that. But that's what we're looking at. And then uh, monthly from there on. Okay. I think, this, I think this works really well for people. Yeah, great. Very and well. Will you send email, uh, like an email notification for the next call? Oh, um, please, I'm, you know, I don't know. I'll have to ask our administrator. Are we collecting the emails of people who participated to make sure that they get on our list? I hope so. <laughs> okay, well, I'll ask it when we do our debrief and make sure. So you have your email um, on our registration, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so we have it. So you, you can, can also you can also check our website, which shows up here on this slide, the next to the last item. Um, the calendar there will tell when our next um, clinic is going to be. Also, usually is some kind of publication on next door. If you uh, okay. frequent the website there. won't have anything now because we haven't really moved ahead on on our calendar on on the on the uh, plant clinic yet. We just did a couple to see how it went, and we're really happy with it. So we intend to continue. Okay, awesome. Great. Thank you so much. And not me being like, not really a gardener. This is super helpful. So well, I think you're on your way. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate all your help and um, collective knowledge. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.